frequency of the forcing matches the natural frequency of the system, the result is called resonance. Right, and like when resonance forcing, that's fine. Yeah. Um, like you mentioned, um, it can be um, the frequency can approximately match when they're very close. What happens is that the beats are so long, the amplitude increases for so long that we can, it basically looks like true resonance. Um, and when this happens, the blank of the solutions increases forever, amplitude. And when amplitudes of oscillations increase and decrease in a regular pattern, that's called beating. Good. Okay, so today we're going to study the effect of sinus sinusoidal forcing on an undamped harmonic oscillator. So we've already studied sinusoidal forcing, right? But we studied it on the damped harmonic oscillator. So today we're going to take away the damping coefficient. Um, and see what happens when we when we apply sinusoidal forcing. Okay, so the three-step extended linearity principle that we've been using this chapter that involves solve the homogeneous system, find a particular solution using lucky guess, and then add them together, right? That will still work um, today. However, the general solution of the unforced equation will not tend towards zero because there's no damping, right? With no damping and no forcing, so you're just solving an unforced harmonic oscillator with no damping, what do the solutions to that thing look like? Picture a mass on a spring, no friction. It's just going to keep going forever, yeah. So the solutions are sinusoidal. Or if we were thinking in the phase portrait, um, we, they would be centers, right? It's just going to keep moving forever, doing the exact same thing. No forcing, no friction. All right, so now we're going to think about what happens to this undamped harmonic oscillator that's just sinusoidal, just oscillating, same amplitude forever, if we add a sinusoidal forcing function. So we're going to input energy into the system in a sinusoidal way. Um, so here's an example. Notice there's no y prime term because the y prime term represents the damping effect. So I have no damping here. And I have a cosine forcing function. All right, so if I want to solve this, it's cosine omega t. So we're just going to study this for a um, generic omega. So that omega determines the period or the frequency of the forcing. So we're going to solve it for a generic omega and then study what happens as we change that frequency. All right, so our general process was one, solve the homogeneous system. Y double prime plus 2Y equals zero. So we set up the characteristic equation to get the eigenvalues. And this is going to be S squared. There's no Y prime term, so there's going to be no S term in the characteristic equation. Plus 2 equals 0. And then you just solve that, and you get S is plus or minus I root 2. So I have um, strictly imaginary eigenvalues which is what we would expect because we knew the solution to this thing should be a center. And when you have strictly imaginary eigenvalues, um, the phase portrait ends up being a center. So I have sinusoidal solutions. All right, so then um, my complex solution looks like e to the lambda t. So this would be e to the i root 2 t. And you only have to pick one of your lambdas. And then we can apply Euler's formula. So instead of e to the i root 2 t, that would be cosine root 2 t plus i sine root 2 t. So that's a complex solution, right? So just call that y sub c for complex. And then when I want to find the general solution to the homogeneous system, y sub h, I can take the real part and the imaginary part of the complex solution, 
take a linear combination and I've got the, the general solution, a real general solution to the homogeneous system. So it's going to be K1 cosine root 2 T plus K2 sine root 2 T. All right, so there's my, my step one, solve to the homogeneous system. And it does appear to be strictly sinusoidal. There's no um, exponential terms in there. Strictly sinusoidal solution, as expected. Okay, so step two. Yeah, that's how we that's how we've been solving complex um, when we get complex eigenvalues. You use Euler's formula, and then it what happens is the real part is a solution all by itself. It's a particular solution all by itself. If you plugged in the second derivative of the real part plus two times the real part, it will give you zero. And then the imaginary part without the i is also its own solution. So when you take a linear combination of two solutions, that gives you the general solution. So that's been our sort of our standard approach when we're trying to solve something that has complex eigenvalues. All right, so step two is to find a particular solution to the forced equation. So I want to solve y double prime plus 2y equals cosine omega t. And I could use a lucky guess, a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. Or we could use complexification, which is what we, the technique we learned last class. So I'll go with that just so that um, we get some more practice with it. So instead of cosine omega t, I'm going to put in e to the i omega t. Right. As Euler's formula for e to the i omega t, you could replace e to the i omega t with cosine omega t plus i sine omega t. So I'm complexifying this thing, um, but I really am only interested in the real part of the solution, right? Because e to the i omega t is cosine omega t plus i sine omega t, and I'm only interested in the cosine omega t. So I just, I'm going to solve this instead. The reason this is easier is because there's only going to be one unknown to solve for. Instead of a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t, where you have to solve for an a and a b, here, my lucky guess is going to be a e to the i omega t. So there's only one unknown to solve for. So whether or not that makes it easier, I don't know. But So my guess here is that I'm going to have a y complex solution that looks like a e to the i omega t. Right, because I'm looking for some function y whose second derivative plus 2 times itself gives me e to the i omega t. It's got to be some multiple of e to the i omega t. All right, so when I take the derivative of that thing, I get i a omega e to the i omega t. Chain rule. And then the second derivative is going to be i squared becomes negative. I'm going to have omega squared a e to the i omega t. Just the chain rule. All right, so once I have my guess and the two derivatives, then I plug back into the original equation, plug in the second derivative, two times the first, two times the function itself, and figure out what does the a have to be to make that equal i omega t, e to the i omega t. All right, so y double prime plus 2y equals e to the i omega t, original equation. So y double prime is negative a w squared e to the i omega t plus 2. My original y was my guess, a e to the i omega t, and I need that to equal e to the i omega t. All right, so I, these are like terms on the left. They both have an e to the i omega t. So I'm going to factor that out, e to the i omega t. And what's left is 
2a minus a omega squared. And then for those two equations to be the same, the coefficient on e to the i omega t on the left has to be the same as the coefficient on the right. So there's like a 1 hiding there. So 2a minus a omega squared has to be 1. And I'm trying to solve for a. So I'll factor out an a. And then just divide both sides by 2 minus omega squared. Yeah. So it feels like, you know, we just did a lot of work and it's really tempting to just circle that and be like, I'm done, but you got to keep, zoom back out, right? Big picture. We're not even done finding the Y complex. I mean, the, the Y particular yet. So what I just found was the A value for A E to the I omega T. Right, that was my guess at a complex solution, and I did find a value of A. So this is 1 over 2 minus omega squared e to the i omega t. Now I can take my e to the i omega t, convert it using Euler's formula. So this is still a complex solution because there are i's in it. 1 over 2 minus omega squared times cosine omega t plus i sine omega t. And then which part of this complex solution am I interested in? The real part or the imaginary part? The real part, right? Because um, I own, my forcing function was cosine. When your forcing function is cosine, you want the real part. When it's sine, you want the imaginary part. So my y particular, right, I don't need a general solution. I just need a particular solution. And like I was saying before, the real part is its own solution. The imaginary part is another particular solution. In this case, I want the real part. So my particular solution is 1 over 2 minus omega squared cosine omega t. So that was step two, right? So I've solved the homogeneous, unforced equation. And then I found a particular solution to the forced equation using lucky guess, complexifying and using lucky guess. All right, and then the general solution to the whole system is the sum of those two. So I'm going to go to a new page and write the whole general solution down. So my general solution is k1 cosine root 2t plus k2 sine root 2t plus 1 over 2 minus omega squared cosine omega t. All right. Anybody need me to go back, cop copy some of the algebra? Yeah? I think that shows pretty much everything, and I'll pause. Okay, so looking at that general system, let's go back to my, my solution here. This was the solution to the non-forced function, the unforced equation. So this is called the unforced response or the natural response. Right, that's the solution to the unforced equation. And then we tacked on this additional piece, the particular solution to the forced equation. So this is called the forced response.
All right, so looking at this sinusoidal function, that's the unforced response, what is its frequency, right? And remember, frequency is um, b over 2 pi, right, the, the coefficient on t over 2 pi. So the frequency of this guy, b over 2 pi, it's just the reciprocal of period, if you, because you tip, we typically talk about period and pre-calc. Um, but the reciprocal of that is called frequency, so in this case it would be root 2 over 2 pi. And then when we look at the forced response, its frequency, b over 2 pi, would be what? Omega over 2 pi. Yep. So the unforced response, it has two sinusoidal functions in it, but they have the same frequency, root 2 over 2 pi. And then my forced response, it has a frequency omega over 2 pi. So it depends on what the omega is. It depends on how frequently this forced response is affecting the system. So this is root 2 over 2 pi and omega over 2 pi. So here are some graphs um, of typical solutions. These are just computer-generated graphs. Um, they all use an initial value of 0, 0. And I have some different values of omega, right? So if you have um, an omega value for the forcing function of a half, you get this thing. Looks kind of like an EKG or something. And then when omega is 1, similar, the amplitudes get a little bit bigger and a little bit smaller, right? And then when omega is 1.2, we get this really clear increasing and decreasing of the amplitude of the solution. So the amplitudes of the oscillations increase and decrease in a regular pattern. And this phenomenon is called beating. And it's most evident when the frequency of the forcing function is close to the natural frequency of the system. So in the 1.2 case, 1.2 is pretty close to um, root 2. Root 2 is like 1.414. So 1.2 is pretty close, so you really see these obvious beats. Um, so terms that are ve have very close frequencies, when you add them together, they tend to either amplify each other or cancel each other out. So think about it in terms of um, pushing someone on a swing. If you're pushing almost at the same time as the swing's natural frequency, you can either make the swing go higher, or if you're pushing at the exact wrong time, you, you stop the swing. Right? So the swing's amplitude will get bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. And you can hear this phenomenon when someone plays two notes that are just slightly out of tune with each other. Um, two different instruments or two different tones um, from from a speaker, right? If they're just slightly out of tune, you hear the volume go up and down. And I found a good example of it on YouTube. So let me pull that up. 